Well, first of all, thank you very much for joining on this very important day, the 10th anniversary of International Widows Day. And I welcome all the distinguished speakers, party participants, and friends uh, who are also joining us from more or less all over the world. We have a huge number of people who are listening to this uh, webinar. And today is a big day for us at the Lumba Foundation as it marks 10 years since the UN announced June 23 as International Widows Day. It takes me back to the time in 2005 when we actually launched International Widows Day as a special day to support widows around the world. And this was announced by our president, Mrs. Sheri Blair, who's with us now uh, at the House of Lords uh, in 2005. Now, that wasn't the end of it because after 20, 2005, Sheri and I and some of our other sponsors, supporters, even um, Raj Singh Peter and uh, Harjeev Singh and many, many, many to name who really joined this rally and we campaigned with the United Nations uh, to recognize this day. As a matter of fact, we published a book, uh, Invisible forgotten widows and that book was presented to Ban Ki-moon, then the Secretary General, and it say, said on the book, um, uh, on the uh, front of the book, why the UN should recognize International Widows Day. And we gave a lot of examples uh, in, uh, about the plight of widows uh, in all developing countries across Asia, in uh, of, uh, of Africa and South America. And uh, it was a five years tireless campaign. And I have to mention this uh, because this is the reality that it wouldn't have happened if Shuri was not involved in it. Because every year we went to America, to New York particularly, at least two times, if not more, and presented our case to different people. We went from door to door uh, to visit the UN representatives from member states and convince them. So. On 23rd of June, 2010, we were told that this day will be recognized. And so it happened at the 65th UN General Assembly. And the Sherry's words were, Raj, don't think that this is the end of the game. Actually, it is the start. And I did believe her. And since then, as it is 10th year today, we have been working hard over the last 10 years to make sure that the United Nations helped us and we should help widows all over the world. We have educated children of poor widows. We have also empowered a lot of widows in almost 12 different countries, uh, naming Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, um, 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 Kenya, Uganda, um, uh, South Africa, Tanzania, Malawi, uh, Chile, and Guatemala. So I feel that we really needed to do that. And with this, what's happened 
it has become like a movement. Uh, you wouldn't believe it that I have received so many emails today from America and from other countries who are telling me that we started our charity after 2010 and it is growing. For example, from America, there is a charity called Modern Widows Club. They have 17 chapters uh, in different states and they are helping a lot of widows. Similarly, there is uh, a friend of mine called Heather and she is in New York. She set up a charity called uh, Global Fund for Widows and she is now um, helping widows in Egypt, in uh, Kenya and many other countries. She did both Ka Ka uh, Caroline and Heather have become big players in addressing the problem of widows. Similarly, there's another person in, um, uh, in America, uh, Christine Miko. Um, she has written a book as well on widows because she is a widow herself and uh, she has given some experience. In England, there is a whole lot of charities. I believe there are now nearly 100 charities and uh, Margaret Owen uh, and uh, many other um, um, people are pursuing this issue because the widows are suffering from poverty, from illiteracy, from conflict, from social injustice and disease. And uh, as you know, that in fragile countries, there are refugees and those refugee women are really mistreated. And I think the government should do something to address that problem. Then there is also an issue of half widows where during these conflicts, the husbands have been murdered or disappeared, leaving a widow, but she does not know whether her husband is alive or not alive. So it's terrible for these women. Uh, in countries across Africa and India, there are some local customs due to which widows suffer a lot and uh, they are ostracized, they are stigmatized, and they are abused, both physically, psychologically, and sexually by their own family members. There's a problem of trapping young girls. There's a problem of young girls forced to marry. I mean, I could go on and on but there are number of problems uh, because which widows have had to suffer and face. A similar situation um, which was there when my mother became widow uh, in 1954 and I was only 10 years old and she was told by her mother-in-law who herself was a widow that remove jewelry, remove bindi, and change into white clothes, and you should never wear uh, colored clothes for the rest of life. Now, I was only 10 years old, and I couldn't understand what was going on. However, when I got married, I was astonished that the priest, who's an educated person, who actually asked my mother to move away from the altar because uh, she could bring bad luck to the newly wedded couple. Now that made me very angry because a mother who gave me birth, a mother who educated me, a mother who always wished me well, how can she bring bad luck? Now that thing has been haunting me for the rest of my life, even to this day, uh, because that is the uh, dehumanizing a woman unnecessarily and wrongly. And 
as my mother passed away, I set up this Lumba Foundation in her memory uh, to make sure that women widow's status is improved and this problem is removed. And uh, we are getting there, but there is a lot to do yet and it will not happen regardless what the United Nations do, do until unless the local governments take initiatives. Um, you know, they need to set up a national commission for widows. They need to set up uh, widow centers in villages and other places because they are not being looked after. When they are in problem, they don't know where to turn to. So there should be some work done by the local government. They should look into the problem, set up some policies and help widows. I will only then be content. Um, I have to say that uh, Mrs. Blair has been a pillar of the Lumpa Foundation and we would not be there where we are today without her help and as well as from my family, especially my wife, who has always stood by me and, and we have continued for 23 years now uh, uh, without any break, uh, you know, uh, trying to help widows all over the world. And uh, as I said before, we have worked in 12 different countries and we know a lot of things what happens. We have published a World Widows Report, which was also presented to the United Nations. That is, in fact, the very first book uh, of research study on widows in the whole world, by, uh, in which we have identified that there are 258 million widows around the world, and their number is increasing because of the disease and conflict. And uh, I, as I said, there's a lot of work to do and I'm very grateful to all of you to give me support because this uh, webinar is reaching a lot of people and it will probably uh, inspire them to also join us and help with those. Thank you. Now, before I go, I would like uh, a video to be shown uh, that how people in the government and individuals have helped us to solve this problem. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lord. I'll just play the video. It just bears with me one second. I hope you can all see the screen. I'm just going to center it. Today, our beach, Dr. Lumba Ji and Mr. Srimati Ji, are विदेश के उन्नीविन्न भागों में और विदेशों में भी विधवाओं के कल्याण के लिए काम करते हैं सम्मान के साथ हमारी ये माताएं बहनें जीवन गुजारा करें उस दिशा में उनका जो प्रयास है 
उसका मैं अभिनंदन करता हूं दोनों पति पत्नी जी जान से इस काम में लगे रहते हैं I think what is so striking about your foundation is that when I first discovered uh, uh, about the work that you do, my first question was, why was, that, why was this never done before? It's such an obvious missing piece of the jigsaw that if we want to promote the interests of children by promoting the interests of women, that we must particularly pay attention to, uh, to those many, many, many uh, widows uh, around uh, the world. Your continuing support for the foundation, we can continue to educate widows' children we can continue to help widows gain that financial independence they so badly need, and in particular, campaign worldwide to ensure that widows and their children obtain their basic human rights. In many parts of the world, customs and traditions prevent widows from providing for themselves and their families. Their children frequently have to leave school and become vulnerable to child labor slavery, drug trafficking, and prostitution. The Lumba Trust works to break this cycle of poverty by caring for the children of widows. They may find themselves ill-equipped to deal with legal or financial matters because they've not been given the opportunity to receive a basic education. So we have to work together to ensure that widows are not denied their basic human rights. We need to work to improve the structure of support for widows raising young children we have to enable them to learn skills and have the opportunity to earn a living for themselves and their families. I'm proud to be the patron and chief of the Lumba Foundation and have supported their work since 2004. Please support the vital work the Lumba Foundation is doing to help suffering widows around the world. Thank you so much. We're done with the video, Lord Lumba. Yeah, now I pass the uh, mic to uh, Harjeev, who will uh, moderate the discussion uh, amongst our participants. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who's joined uh, uh, in this sort of commemoration of 10 years of uh, the Lumba Foundation getting its uh, UN International Widows Day recognition. Uh, I'm Harjeev Singh. I'm one of the trustees uh, on the foundation uh, for the last 14 years. And I'm delighted to have such a stellar cast of uh, speakers uh, with us. Uh, I'd like to do a quick round of introductions. Uh, of course, our tireless president, Sheree Blair, uh, who's uh, really been uh, the engine of support that has got us a lot of this recognition uh, over the last two decades. Uh, we also have uh, Mrs. Fatima Madhubayo from uh, Sierra Leone, who's the First Lady of Sierra Leone. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Amitabh Khan, who's the CEO of Niti Aayog in India. Uh, we have uh, also Simone Mensa representing uh, Mrs. Sylvia Pongo from Gabon, uh, the First Lady of Gabon. Uh, and of course, uh, another very dear friend and trustee of ours, uh, Peter Raj Singh, who will be uh, sort of also actually helping translate uh, Simone's part of the uh, talk uh, that she will be sharing. Uh, on that note, I just wanted to quickly, uh, Shuri, invite you to share some of that journey that we've had over the last two decades and, and how we've sort of worked on uh, sort of getting the message out uh, about widows. Uh, and, and as uh, the, one of the video uh, messages said, you know, it's surprising a lot of people hadn't looked at this issue earlier. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Of course, well, I'm delighted and uh, delighted to be president of the Lumba Foundation. Uh, and also sort of delighted that you showed a picture of me looking certainly a, a lot more glamorous pre-COVID uh, lockdown than I am here locked down uh, for nearly 14 weeks now <laughs> in, uh, in uh, England. Um, but uh, you're absolutely right. When I was first approached by Lord Lumba to become associated with the foundation and its uh, president, it, um, I, I must confess that I hadn't realized the extent of the problems experienced by widows worldwide. And I am, it's thanks to the work of the Lumber Foundation and all the people that I have met as a result of that, that I have learned how much widows across the world are disadvantaged, mm -hmm. sometimes because of legal issues in relation to the inheritance of property, Sometimes it's in relation to societal prejudices coming from deep-seated views about 
uh, and 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 superstitions about uh, somehow the widows uh, being tainted because their husbands have died, and of course the associated uh, problems of poverty, ill health, and the impact that that has on their children, um, which means that in too many countries the full potential of the widows and their children is just not being realized. And it's because of that that the Lumber Foundation firstly has worked to promote the welfare of widows throughout the world in its own work, where through its advocacy and its on-the-ground programs providing education for the children of widows and also uh, training in skills for the widows themselves so that they can have the dignity of being able to support their own children because they can support themselves. Um, and that work has gone from strength to strength and I've been very fortunate to see it grow. Of course, one of the things that we were focused on doing, and it's 15 years ago, as Raj has said, was to get International Widows Day recognized by uh, the UN. Uh, and after five years in 2010, we finally got this global day of awareness of the plight of widows recognized by the UN. And the date itself, the 23rd of June, is very significant because, as Lord Lumber has told us, it is in honor of his mother. And when we were looking at a suitable day, we felt what would be the most suitable day would be the day she herself became a widow. So it was in 1954, which I happen to know is 66 years ago, because that's, uh, I was born in September of that year. So it was 66 years ago today that Lord Lumber's father died and his mother became a widow. And this day is as much in memory of her and of every single widow who has been sadly uh, become a widow since that day. Uh, I also, of course, need to acknowledge particularly the, the great help we had from the UN and the work of the government of Gabon, and particularly the First Lady of Gabon, my dear friend Sylvia, who um, has sadly not with us today, but she has sent uh, her right-hand woman in her foundation. Because with it, without the help of Gabon, who at the time, in the September of uh, 2010, held the presidency of the Security Council and through their adopting the cause of uh, International Widows Day, that we were able to get it observed. And I remember the UN declaring it and then we went straight from there to Gabon to join in the celebrations in Libreville. Uh, and Sylvia and I walked through the streets of Libreville celebrating that work. And I was able to see the great work, which I'm sure we'll hear more about, that her foundation does uh, with families. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't say we had a huge amount of help from the government of India too. And that's why I'm so happy that Ambitaz Kant is here. As you said, Bajiv, he's uh, not only a member of the Indian Administration Service, but is CEO of the National Institution for Transforming India. And I know you focus a lot on economic growth. And I know also that you understand, as we understand, that unless we enable widows to play their full role in society uh, and to contribute on their own behalf, on behalf of their children, mm -hmm. then India will not achieve the growth that you are so uh, actively striving for. And finally, I wouldn't want to say, I wouldn't want to ignore the amazing First Lady of Sierra Leone, who is also a friend of mine, and, and Fatima, the work that you do on behalf of women and girls in Sierra Leone, and uh, the discussions we've had of many of the, the issues which uh, arise over female-headed households, and particularly the plight of young girls married too soon and then often widowed at, at a very young age with young children. So I look forward to our discussion uh, coming in the uh, few uh, moments ahead. I'm still very passionate about this cause, and it's become more urgent at the moment because, of course, as the Secretary General of the UN has pointed out in his message to Mark today, uh, COVID is hitting disproportionately men above women, and that means that there are many more widows being created 
across the world because of the scourge of the virus. And they too need our help if they are going to be able not only to cope with the inevitable sadness and adjustment uh, to losing a beloved partner, but also to the fact that still in today's society, uh, they are in too many places regarded as not full equal members of society. And we need to make sure that today's widows and the widows who have been created over the years do not suffer that prejudice, okay. that lack of uh, human rights, uh, and that their children too uh, don't have to make the sacrifices which no child should be expected uh, to make. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, I'll pass back to you, Hajiv, to introduce the rest of the panel. Great, thank, thank you, Sheree. Uh, could I call on Mr. Khan uh, to uh, share his views? You know, you've been a great supporter of the foundation for many, many years. Uh, and in the context of COVID, uh, would, would you be able to shed some light on some of the initiatives? I know the government uh, very quickly, as soon as we went into lockdown, announced pensions for uh, widows and uh, some, some of the uh, various categories uh, that, that needed the help most. Uh, if you could maybe shed some light, it'd be great. I know you have a very hard stop. So, uh, if I can just call on you. Your uh, mic needs to be unmuted. Uh, yeah. Uh, at the outset, let me express my deep appreciation uh, for the great work that is being undertaken by the Lumba Foundation, uh, particularly in an area of, uh, which is mostly ignored and left unaddressed. And I wanted to especially compliment uh, Mrs. Sherry Blair for her leadership. Uh, I'm very happy to note that this, uh, that this foundation is doing such immense work across the world. And uh, this speaks volumes about the will and determination of the Lumba Foundation team. Uh, I'm aware that the origin of this foundation can be traced back to Dhilwan in rural Punjab. And uh, this has had a great inspiration uh, to many other work which has been done in India in recent times. And uh, uh, your commitment to this cause is evident by the sustained campaign that you have led ultimately convincing the United Nations General Assembly to recognize 23rd June as uh, International Widows' Day. Let me say that India is committed to the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the underlying philosophy of which is to ensure that no one is left behind. And as such, addressing the challenges faced by widows is critical. Uh, we have a SDG India Index, which tracks several indicators that pertain to the welfare of women in the country particularly of widows. And uh, there are several welfare schemes of Government of India, uh, one of which is housing for uh, widows. We have uh, the financial assistance, the National Social Assistance Program, which provides pension to those over 60 years of age, widows, disabled persons. Then we have vocational training and livelihoods. And uh, we have, uh, during the COVID-19, the Indian government was cognizant of the fact that pandemics can really exacerbate the challenges faced by already vulnerable groups like widows. And therefore, uh, especially during uh, lockdown, widows may not have access to bank accounts. This was a huge challenge and pensions to pay for health care if they too become ill or support themselves on how they'll support themselves and their children. And therefore, uh, the government of India therefore decided to advance three months pension to nearly 30 million widows uh, with disability in the first week of April, uh, in the midst of the lockdown on account of COVID-19. And a total sum of rupees 28 billion was dispersed to the beneficiaries and two institutions. Mr. Kant, your voice is, uh, we lost your audio. Can you hear us?
Ashar, can you just check? Us? Can you hear me? Now we can. Yeah. Uh, so as I was saying that uh, during COVID-19, uh, during this pandemic period, uh, the government of India decided to advance three months pension to nearly 30 million widows uh, in the first week of April, Amos, in the midst of the lockdown on account of COVID-19 and a total sum of rupees 28 billion was disbursed to the beneficiaries in two installments directly into their bank account. It was a direct benefit transfer. Uh, the government has also partnered with a large number of international and civil society organizations as they play a critical role in supporting vulnerable groups like widows at the local level. Uh, we have various schemes and legal provisions existing for protecting the rights of widows and ensuring their welfare in India. Uh, these are implemented and monitored rigorously. A key enabler for responsive planning, implementation and monitoring of various policies and programs for vulnerable groups is, according to us, very timely and accurate data. The government at multiple levels is making efforts to strengthen, streamline and integrate data systems. Protecting the rights of, um, uh, you know, widows cannot be achieved by government alone. It is imperative that civil society organizations, as well as citizens, uh, continue to do their bit by creating awareness about the issues faced by vulnerable groups. We will work in partnership with all foundations, particularly uh, voluntary groups uh, like the Lumba Foundation, and we will continue uh, to work for the cause of the widows. Uh, I would like to conclude and I would like to again compliment the Lumba Foundation, particularly Mrs. Sherry Blair for her leadership of this foundation and for the remarkable work that they have done. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Khan. I appreciate your time. Uh, I'll now come to uh, the first page. Uh, if you could unmute yourself, I, will, I can see you're muted. Uh, I, uh, I w wanted to sort of uh, congratulate you on the great work you do around women's issues in Africa, uh, across Pan-Africa. I know you had uh, also sort of led a campaign uh, recently called Hands Off Our Girls across Six Nations there uh, in West Africa. Uh, could you share a, a little bit of your perspectives and thoughts on uh, what could be done around widows, uh, either in Sierra Leone or across that region, uh, as some of these challenges are similar around the world, uh, and would love to hear your thoughts on, on what we could do there. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to take the opportunity to thank um, Sherry Blair for inviting me to this wonderful discussion. Um, uh, it's a noble discussion, and I think it's, it's really timing for it. the right time to also have this kind of conversation. But I really want to say thank you to Raj Lomba. Normally, a situation like this, it's the women who were actually widows who championed something like this. But for a man to champion an issue like this, I want to say this is an honorable, honorable venture. And I thank you for making me be part of this process. Now, in Sierra Leone, the widow, it's, it's very difficult for widows in Sierra Leone. First of all, when a man died here, um, because of the polygamy rate in, in Sierra Leone, when one man died, four women become uh, widows automatically. Now, when you have four women as widows, now there's the issue of who takes their husband's property. Where will the children be? If that man has one house, the brothers, the uncles, the aunties, the, the parents, they all want to take the husband's property. So at the end of the day, uh, the, the wife that is the favorite wife among the family is uh, most times the one who would remain in the house. If the, if the husband only have one wife, they will, there will be a, uh, uh, they would ask if the wife is willing to marry to another brother. If that wife now refused to marry to another brother, then the family try to gang on the wife and make sure they kick the wife and, the, and her kids out of their house. And that will now give, I mean, put so much strain on the woman. Um, the poverty rate on that family would be so huge. When a woman is the only um, breadwinner for herself and, and 
all the children in the house, that is a very difficult situation. The government has actually tried to uh, enact the devolution uh, of Estate Act in 2007 to give women the, the power also, if a man dies without a will, uh, leaving a will behind, so that they can also have access to that property. But the tradition is so deep in Sierra Leone that um, women always have to fight when their husband says, so not about just losing your husband, they don't consider the kind of pain you're going through. They don't consider the emotional stress you're going through. Now, the stress they impose on you is one that you have, I mean, it's, if you don't take their offer, it's like they will present an offer to you. You marry to a brother and then you stay in the home or if you decide to go against us, we will take everything that our brother owns, we'll take the money, we'll take the house, we'll take everything and you and your kids will have to go and start somewhere else as if the, the kids, the, the children of that woman is not part of the family. So it is very difficult. And Sierra Leone has gone through war. Now you have a whole lot of young women, young women in Sierra Leone who are widows because of the war. You have more men that die during the war than women. So you have more widows with children. So it, it just leads to a whole lot of broken homes. If there is no father in the home, the woman take care of the home automatically, that home you don't get the kind of uh, 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 satisfaction that you want for a family. Then the issue of rape, the issue of early marriage, because then when the child becomes 12, 13, the best thing the mother thinks about is, you know what, let me give this child away for a marriage so that uh, the burden will be not on me anymore, but it will be on her husband. So that the, the rate of education in that home would be so low. No one is empowered to do anything during this coronavirus. You know, my office realized that this is a very serious issue in the country, and then it's going to affect so many women as, um, as because we don't have help. Now, I was shocked to know that there is a widow's day around the world. I was really shocked, you know, that's the reason why um, Lord Lumba, I, I actually um, reached out to you to say, can you tell me what, have been, what has been happening? Because that opportunity has not reached to Sierra Leone. And I believe within the South um, Sahara Africa, we all have the same issue. You have more Muslims around this end. And where you have the Muslims, then that's where you have polygamy. And where you have polygamy, that's where you have more women becoming widows. Because when one man dies, you're talking about four women become widows, I mean, instantly. So an opportunity like this, you know, will be so much appreciated in a place like Sierra Leone, just because of our history of the war and the history of the Ebola virus. And now the, the, the corona that we are, the whole world is grappling with, I think, you know, with all the countries that you have named that you're working, if you can also consider Sierra Leone as part of a country that desperately needs such a help. Because really, with, if you go through the history of Sierra Leone and understand why, as I sit here with you, I am actually, um, um, we, are, we have a very serious situation in Sierra Leone right now of a little girl called Khadija. Who, 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 who died mysteriously, and we're trying to find out. There's been a whole lot of allegation of um, um, rape uh, on this little girl. She's only five years old. They're talking about allegation on rape. But then when you look at the family history, um, uh, the mother is not there, the father is not there, the girl is with an extended family, and then you now begin to see the problem. And this is a little five-year-old beautiful girl who just somebody just from nowhere, somebody, some crazy fool just decided that, you know what, I'm going to try and do this to this girl or if, I mean, or silence her. We're still waiting for a police report to come out so that we actually know what actually happened to this girl because a, a five-year-old kid cannot just die mysteriously. That all come, when you put all of that and look at the environment of this kind of situation, you then end up seeing a broken home where there is no leadership, there is nobody, they are taking care of the home, you know, the kids are left by themselves. They are left to look after each other. The parents go their own ways and come back in the evening. There's nobody to supervise these homes, you know. So I think widows, really we need to look at the, the plight of widows all around the world, but in Africa particularly, it is very dying here. And people don't want to talk about it. People just don't, when you die, you know, if you're young, your husband died in Africa, you, I mean, you have a bad luck. So, Lord Lumba, when you're talking about your mother, 
you know, when another man even wants to come around this young lady, a young lady just lost their husband, somebody else, she's now attracted to another man and she's hoping that that relationship will work. And then you'll have somebody else going around telling the man, oh, you know, she just lost her husband and I think she's bad luck. If you go to her again, you might also lose your life. So all of this stigma, this stigma on, 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 on being a widow in Africa is, 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 is really unbelievable. And you, you actually begin, and it's the people who actually believe that they are educated. They are the ones that are worse when it comes to this. So I believe the world has to really educate because we all know someone is going to die eventually anyway. Who is dying first is, you know, we, nobody have that, that, the answer to those things. So we need to educate. And I don't think also it's just women suffer more. But then you also have men, men who are widows, you know, men who are part of this thing. When a man has a wife and the wife died first time, second time, no woman wants to marry to that man anymore. Because they said, oh, no, 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 you know, when you're married to this person, you're going to die, you know, so everybody, your, your, your mental state is prepared to say, if somebody died around this person, then it is the person's fault. They don't look at the medical thing. They don't want to know what happened to the person, how the person died. No, as long as you are with them, it is your bad omen. It is your bad luck that created the situation for the person to die. So I would really appreciate if you know, I mean, Sherem, you know, we've been, we've been talking about everything that we needed to do. I really would appreciate if you, if you consider Sierra Leone as one by hopefully next year, when we celebrate this day that is now in my diary that I know is a very important day for me, when we celebrate this, we'll also announce that Sierra Leone is also part of the, the country that you are working with because we need it. We need it for so many reasons due to the war, due to the Ebola and now coronavirus. So 11 years of war, you have a whole generation that have lost so much, you know, and then you come to the Ebola. We had Ebola, 4,000 people died of the Ebola in Sierra Leone, and most of them are also men. So then, like I said to you, when a one man died in Sierra Leone, four women become widows. So I think we need this kind of help so desperately, and I'm hoping that you will consider us in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, we certainly, we, certain, we certainly will, Fatima, and we couldn't have a better advocate for the plight of widows and for the rights of women and girls in Sierra Leone than you. So thanks for those remarks. Thank you, Mark. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Fatima. That, that was uh, very passionately communicated. I just wanted to share a very poignant moment uh, that I remember uh, when UN Women launched. Uh, Lord Bumba had uh, conducted uh, a commission to study uh, which is the first study ever done about how many widows there are in the world. And I remember we were in New York at the UN Women Conference and we were on a panel and, at the, and, and the room was absolutely packed uh, with women from all over the world and a lot of NGOs who come to New York for this. One lady from Cote d'Ivoire got up and literally cried and thanked him and gave him a hug for putting the, the plight of widows up there. And um, you know, we have seen, I have seen this, I know Sharia has seen it and Peter has seen it over the years, that just documenting and making sure that these stories are uh, told uh, every, uh, every year uh, and spread as wide as possible. Uh, so everybody who's listening to this, please share this because we all have uh, people we know who are in, in, in uh, similar situations where we can be of help. Uh, on that note, I'd, I'd love to call on uh, Simone to share her perspective from uh, Gabon. Uh, and uh, Peter, you'll be doing the uh, translation uh, with Simone? Yes. Thank you, Peter. Simone, uh, we'd love to sort of hear a little bit about the work that you uh, and, of course, uh, Sylvia have been doing in Gabon around uh, the foundation that you run. You have been one of the biggest champions for the Lumba Foundation, thanks to Gabon's help and Sylvia's help, we were able to uh, get ourselves recognized uh, at the UN. Uh, would love to hear some of the work that you Bonjour à tous et merci de l'opportunité que vous me donnez de participer à cette conférence virtuelle. Permettez-moi aussi de vous transmettre les salutations de la Première Dame du Gabon qui ne pouvait pas être là, mais pour qui cette journée et cette conférence sont très, très importantes. Alors, je, peux, je, peux, je peux traduire? Oui. Okay. Um, yes. 
Uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, permit me first of all to thank you for the honor of participating uh, alongside leading individuals in this virtual conference. Uh, the First Lady of uh, Gabon unfortunately couldn't be present, but assures you that this is a very important day for her. Merci. Alors, pour uh, répondre à votre première question, je voudrais rappeler que l'adoption donc de cette résolution par l'Assemblée la, par générale des Nations Unies qui instaure le, le 23 juin comme journée internationale des veuves est le résultat d'un long combat que nous avons mené ensemble avec la Fondation Lumba et ONU Femmes. Et euh, Madame Sylvia Bongondimba et la diplomatie gabonaise avaient en amont porter le projet de résolution au nom de différents pays afin que soient reconnus les droits des millions de personnes en situation de veuvage dans le monde. Okay. Uh, to respond to your question, I'd like to recall the resolution uh, 65-169 of the 21st of December 2010 by the General Assembly of the United Nations to institute the 23rd of June as International Widows' Day, which was the result of a long and concerted uh, collaborative effort with the Lumba Foundation and UN Women by the First Lady of Gabon, uh, Madame Sylvia Bongo. Uh, Gabonese diplomacy brought the resolution forward on behalf of many different countries in order to recognize the rights of millions of persons Um, in the situation of being widows around the world. C'est dire que il est extrêmement important pour nous que les outrages et les sévices multiples que subissent les veuves soient dénoncés et que nous œuvrions ensemble pour changer les donnes. Tout simplement par souci d'équité pour préserver les droits de l'homme. It's extremely um, important for us that atrocities faced by widows are denounced and that we work together to change these practices um, in order to advance the cause of um, universal human rights. Alors après la victoire diplomatique aux Nations Unies, il fallait maintenant s'attaquer aux réalités du terrain. C'est un vaste chantier qui méritait qu'on s'y consacre et qu'on y travaille en profondeur. Et la réussite donc de ce chantier nécessite un engagement de toutes les composantes de la société, les politiques, les juridiques, les juristes, les leaders d'opinion, les associations, les chefs traditionnels, les victimes elles-mêmes, les veuves elles-mêmes. Et notre fondation a usé de son leadership pour fédérer toutes ces forces vives de la nation. Okay. After the diplomatic victory, uh, we needed to attack the realities on the ground. It's a vast domain that um, merits us dedicating ourselves and working together in a, in a concerted and profound way. Success necessitates engagement by all sectors of society, political, legal, public opinion leaders, civil society, traditional chiefs, and the victims themselves. Since 2011, we have been engaged in two principal um, axes of action. Aussi, depuis 2011, nous sommes engagés principalement sur deux axes majeurs. Tout d'abord, la mobilisation citoyenne, afin d'encourager un changement de comportement à tous les niveaux au niveau institutionnel, sociétal, familial et communautaire. Okay, this, on these two axes of um, engagement, um, we've been trying to mobilize citizens to encourage a, a change of behavior in all parts of society, institutional, societal, familial, and um, in communities and also we've sought to bring about reforms and innovations um, through legislative action as well as um, administrative uh, activities in favor of the widow's cause. 
C'est dans ce cas donc que l'on assiste à la création de l'Observatoire national de protection des droits de la famille en 2012, la mise en place de divers organismes d'aide sociale pour les veuves et plus généralement les personnes fragilisées, la mise en place d'une cellule d'assistance juridière judiciaire au niveau des tribunaux, des cours d'appel et de cassation, composée notamment de magistrats et destinée à apporter une aide juridique aux conjoints survivants et aux orphelins en, en, en but à des difficultés pour faire valoir leurs droits, mais également l'adoption au mois de mai 2015 de la deuxième partie du Code civil sur les successions au Gabon. Et ce texte qui est fondamental apporte des innovations importantes telles le renforcement des droits du conjoint survivant, le renforcement des pouvoirs des officiers de police judiciaire en cas de délit ou spoliation, la pénalisation de certains actes de violence perpétrés contre la veuve et l'orphelin et la réorganisation du conseil de famille en conseil sussexoral. Since 2011, um, we've uh, worked in various, through various frameworks. Um, we have created a national um, observance for, um, for protecting rights of um, the family in 2012. Um, we've put in place um, social security aid uh, vehicles. Um, we've got um, judicial assistance at the um, level of courts to protect um, the rights of widows. Um, we have adopted in 2015 the second part of a civil code um, dealing with inheritance in Gabon. Um, we are reinforcing rights of survivorship um, and um, we are also penalizing acts of violence against uh, against widows and um, focused on uh, protecting uh, survivorship rights. Alors, des changements notables ont été apportés, notamment sur le plan législatif, en vue de mieux préserver le conjoint survivant, mais sans une sensibilisation de masse ces innovations demeurent lettres mortes. C'est la raison pour laquelle, chaque année, nous sommes sur le terrain. En diversifiant nos cibles, nous allons auprès du conjoint survivant, mais pas uniquement, car c'est une problématique sociétale qui est très importante et qui nécessite une prise de conscience collective. Aussi, nous nous adressons aussi bien aux hommes, aux jeunes, dans les écoles, dans les universités, aux maires, aux chefs de quartier qui sont au plus près des populations, aux agents de justice, etc. Significant changes um, have occurred, um, notably um, from, the, from the legislature or legislative activity. Um, to better preserve the rights of um, a surviving spouse, namely widows, but without um, a sensibility um, of um, all the individuals in society, these innovations um, don't really um, take root. It's for this reason that every year we have um, tried to to focus on all elements of society needed to bring about change, including addressing men, young people, um, in schools, in universities, um, in uh, town halls, um, people who lead uh, neighborhoods, and all aspects of the population um, who are agents of justice. En fait, il est important de vulgariser les nouvelles dispositions législatives 
et essayer de convaincre notamment les partisans de la tradition et d'en faire des alliés. Nous constatons en effet que le principal obstacle dans les sociétés africaines demeure le changement des mentalités et la modernisation de nos traditions. Par exemple, certains élus du peuple considèrent que les modifications du code civil dont nous avons parlé sont trop révolutionnaires et entraînent des problèmes de famille la famille dans sa conception traditionnelle. Et ils sont donc réfractaires à leur application. Et d'autres n'admettent pas que la femme, la veuve, puisse être président du conseil successoral après la mort de son mari. C'est um, nécessaire aussi de penser à ces nouvelles innovations législatives et de convince, notably um, people who are acting on behalf of tradition, to be allied in this cause. Um, oftentimes we find that the principal ob obstacles in African societies, um, or the principal obstacle of people who are not willing to change their mentality vis-a-vis um, -vis innovation and um, moving away from uh, conservative traditions. For example, certain elected representatives consider that these modifications of our um, civil code are too revolutionary and are bringing about uh, problems in families uh, with the new in displacing uh, traditional conceptions of how families should function um, and certain people don't admit that uh, a woman can be the head of uh, a household after the death of her husband. Pour conclure, je dirais que la tâche la plus ardue, la plus difficile, est de renverser les idées reçues ou préconçues qui infantilisent ou habilisent les veuves et de faire changer les mentalités. So the, the deepest um, stain um, that we need to, to um, reverse is these um, antediluvian ideas that have been received, these preconceptions that infantilize um, views of widows and, um, and do not permit us to change uh, these very entrenched mentalities. Okay. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for translating, and Simone, merci beaucoup uh, for sharing uh, your perspective and all of the great work that, that you have done uh, over the years for the Lumba Foundation, uh, both uh, from uh, Sylvia's perspective. Please thank us on, on, uh, uh, on our behalf. Uh, Peter, uh, I'd like to call on you to kind of do a quick wrap up uh, and thank you to all of the great speakers we've had. Uh, and Lord Lumba, if you have any words at the tail end, please, you can jump in now before we give it to Peter. Well, I would only say that things are getting worse because of COVID-19. And I think we should pay much more attention now to see how we can help these widows. As of today, I understand that there are more than 200,000 widows um, because of COVID. And, you know, the government's should help them because they need their help. And if the government, local governments are unable to help, my proposal is that the G20 countries should get together and set up a, a, a fund to help these unfortunate COVID windows. windows. Thank you. Peter, all yours. Uh, thank you okay. so much for translating. You're, you're welcome. Merci à vous. Um, so, in conclusion, let me thank all the, the many participants who logged on, and we hope this has been useful. Please extend this message through your various networks about this very significant cause. Uh, for my part, I'd like to say that we are all just so deeply inspired and moved by the efforts of Lord Lumba from the first time we met him 
um, to you know, uh, across over a decade of working together and collaborating on this important cause. Um, it should be noted that there are close to 250 million widows in the world. So this is not an insignificant number. And if you count their children, this takes us into um, the billions. Um, Lord Lumba is also living proof how the, the vision and the efforts of one person can actually make a change in the world and uh, bring about um, something significant in his institution of International Widows Day and, and really um, how he brings about attitudinal change. Um, also have to pay tribute to Cherie, whose tireless efforts have been um, simply extraordinary. Um, I recall um, times when she's jumped off a plane from Sao Paulo and gone right into a speech um, to try to get the, the United Nations to, to, to bring um, International Widows Day um, into being. Uh, thank you also to uh, Mr. Kant and, and the First Lady of Sierra Leone for her, for her moving um, words. Um, so there's a lot of work to do. Um, we, we look forward to, to collaborating with all of you online and hope that, um, that we can see you next June 23rd, um, if not earlier. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Peter. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, thank you. And I hope you are all going to share uh, the message about the Lumba Foundation uh, wide and far. Uh, thank you, and stay safe, everybody. Thank you, everyone, so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, Shri, uh, Gabon, and uh, Fatima, and most of all, I think without Harji, this would not have happened. He put all his team to organize today's event, and uh, Peter, you also have been very helpful in making the translation, and I'm pleased that Amitabh Kant, who is a busy man in India, was able to share some thoughts with us today. So once again, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.